Hello, everybody, and welcome to the Blast Motion Podcast. My name is Kyle Adel, and I'm the Director of Professional Baseball here at Blast Motion. I'm joined with Joe Torville, who is our Customer Success Manager on the event side. Joe, how are we doing? Doing great. No, happy to be here. Awesome. So in this episode, we're going to go over the Airy Code games. We were just down at University of San Diego capturing data on some of the top high school players in the nation. For those of you that aren't familiar with the Area Code Games. Joe, can you give us a little summary of what this event is? Cool background. We've been doing this event since 2017. Uh, so we've been doing this for quite some time. I've actually known Joe from that event on both sides. So Joe, go ahead and give us a little recap on what Area Code Games is and we'll dive right into it. Yeah. So Area Code Games is was upper class, underclass. We'll focus more on the upper class today. Uh, but basically, it's the best high school baseball players in the country kind of meeting in one spot in Southern California. It used to be in Long Beach. Now we're in uh, San Diego, which has been a, a pretty good improvement, I think. Uh, a lot of people have mixed opinions on that. But I do like the San Diego uh, location. But basically, you have uh, a handful of major league baseball teams who control each uh, region of the country. So like the Brewers have Southern California. The A's have Northern California. The Royals have Pacific Northwest. Uh, the Rangers take Texas. The White Sox have the Midwest. The Reds will have the Four Corners. The Yankees will have Northeast. And the Nationals will have the Southeast. Um, and then for Can Canadian players, it's kind of split up between, like, uh, Yankees, um, Royals, stuff like that. Um, pretty sure I covered all the teams there. But, yeah, it's uh, basically – so those – Teams that cover that region, uh, they do a pretty lengthy tryout process for the kids of this draft class, for the 24, 2024 draft class. Um, and they select the best players in the region that show up in this one spot. And we have all the best players in each region of the country competing against each other. Um, and they're all usually in the same draft class. Once in a while, you have an underclassman play in the upper class. But it's a really, really, it's a kind of the end of the summer circuit. These kids go through a pretty pretty long summer circuit It kind of starts uh towards like the end of the school year and it's just now wrapping up like yesterday was all american game so it's just kind of wrapping up right now i think the last thing we have is like usa baseball um so it's kind of the end we kind of have a pretty good idea of what these players can do or somewhat of an idea of what these players can do we're getting to know them pretty much but we kind of get a, these the scouts have a pretty good list of players they want to follow in their area from this point on um who it's the draft board is starting to shape up for 2024 which is until like next year. Um, but it's, it's, you, it's an historically like some, one of the best events uh, on the high school baseball circuit, because you do have like that top, that top 10%, uh, the top 10 player uh, that's been kind of like high school famous, so to speak. And then you have a lot of kids that kind of pop up as well. Um, we definitely had some kids pop up in the area code games this past, uh, this past year. So it's just a really, it's a really good uh, event to kind of see, what kind of tools these players have in front of every major league baseball evaluator out there. Um, not so much for the college recruiters, the college recruiters, a lot of these kids are already, already committed. There might be a handful of kids who aren't committed yet. Um, so yeah, we kind of get to see the tools and then we also get to see the performance against players with good tools, which is, uh, which is important. Uh, a lot of these kids are, you know, kind of big fish in small ponds or they're big fish in big ponds, but they play really well. Um, it's just, you kind of have to see this tools versus other tools, um, good tools. So, you know, we want to see good hitters, uh, perform well against good pitches and good pitchers. Um, so that's pretty much, I mean, that's kind of like the summary of area code games. It's my personal favorite event. I told, I mean, I used to work uh, with area code as well before I came over to blast that events like meditation for me. I could be there all day. I could watch every at bat. It's really fun. Um, this, it's one of the most more unique things is like the stands are completely filled up um, with all with all MLB evaluators and you could hear a pin drop. It's completely silent, uh, completely silent. It's that's like I think the coolest part. Uh, everyone there is doing a job. Everyone's working where the players are trying to perform. The scouts are trying to evaluate. The video guys are trying to capture video. The analyst crew is trying to get data from us and track man everyone. It's just it's a really, really cool event. It's one of my favorites. Um, I have a lot of friends that come from there too. So yeah, I could talk about Erico games all day, but I'll, I'll pause. I know you have some questions. So yeah, no, you're all good. Yeah. It is one of my favorite events because literally there's representation from everywhere. You've got 
high level scouts, you've got area code guys, we're there, you've got other tech vendors collecting it. And I know you mentioned that teams run it in regions, uh, but it's important to know that every team is represented there. Like even when you go into the Rangers dugout or the Royals dugout or the Brewers dugout, you see jerseys from every organization. So it's a cool opportunity to have the scouts on the field and truly be represented. We do collect data at the area code games. As you can see here, you've got a picture on the left of a player swinging in game with our sensor. And you can see some of these bat speed and rotational acceleration averages for these top players. Just like you said, they're all playing against the best and we're figuring out where we're going from there. So to dive into it, we're going to talk a little bit about these metrics in the future uh, in this episode, but I think we're going to talk more about the capture process because we really want to tie into why the data capture process is so important and how we stay true to that. So Diving into the capture process, every player at the area code games that is a hitter has a sensor that's designated to them. Uh, at Blast, if you're familiar with our team admin app, you are um, using that throughout the entire event very, very heavily. So a lot of our swings are captured offline, but we assign a sensor to every single player based on every single team. So the Brewers have a bag that have a sensor assigned to every player. We go out there during batting practice and we put the sensors on the bat. That way kids can go and they swing. We capture all of their batting practice data. Throughout our app, we actually tag that data as batting practice because context is very important. We'll talk about that here in a little bit. But we want to understand what the swing looks like in BP and then how it translates into the game. So you've got sensors on bat during BP and then they transition that sensor directly into the game. From a capture standpoint, we don't have to do anything because we create the sessions ahead of time simply in the admin app, and it allows all that data to upload and be tagged. We do look at batting practice versus in-game because we see one of three things happen. One, a player's swing will change dramatically in a bad way towards going in-game. Maybe they're slower, they change their path. Two, it gets a lot better, or three, it stays the same. So having this context is really important for us. Uh, it takes us a while because we do have about 200 sensors on site at all times, but we've gotten that process down. We've been doing it since 2017 and it's become really, really good. Now, as far as metrics go, we, we're going to focus today on bat speed and rotational acceleration. Going back to that previous slide here, you do see what some of those averages look like for players. So we've got mid, uh, mid to low seventies in the bat speed for some of our leaders and rotational acceleration, you've got anywhere from 19 Gs up to 27. Talking a little bit about these metrics right now, bat speed is probably our easiest metric to understand. It's the speed of the sweet spot of the bat at impact. A lot of people talk about bat speed. You've got to be able to swing the bat fast enough to hit it hard and compete at the highest level. Um, and we do see major league averages around 72 miles per hour in game. And we see a lot of that at the area code game from these high school players. One of the metrics we really need to talk about a lot is rotational acceleration because at this level and trying to project players into professional baseball, how hitters accelerate the bat is really important because if you can't accelerate into your peak bat speed fast enough, you're going to have a hard time hitting this higher level pitching when it comes to speed, spin, different pitch locations, and different pitch types. So heading back to our averages major league average for rotational acceleration is 17.2 g's a really easy way to think about this is if you're in the single digits it's a little bit slower if you're in the teens you're going to be kind of in that average college major league range and then anything 20 plus is really lighting it up joe we've got a good metaphor here using cars you want to drop that in and talk about it a little bit here for a sec as you talk about the evaluation process yeah absolutely i mean basically yeah, I mean, if you have two cars going that can both go 75 miles an hour, say like a Mustang and like a Honda, the car that can get to 75 miles per hour quicker, the Mustang over to Honda, tends to win the race. Although Honda does do the Red Bull F1 stuff, so they are pretty quick. But yeah, basically, yeah, the car that gets to 75 miles per hour quicker is going to win the race. It's the same thing with the swing and the same thing with the bat. Um, it's, a, it's a quality that we've seen over the years. And like I think now even more than ever, we're more confident than ever that this is a quality that like is incredibly advantageous for hitters to have at the professional level. Um, there's like a small percentage of players that do end up being pretty successful without it, but they're kind of like outliers. The majority, I guess like 98% of players that we see and evaluate and on the professional level like have this metric. And it's like the same kind of type of story where, you know, 
at the high school level, the college level, and the low low parts of minor league baseball, um, you can be very successful with like just bat speed. Um, but at some point when you get the high A and you're facing like grade 60, 70 pitches, uh, which is like an elite pitch with a lot of movement, but also with control uh, and command, it gets a little different for, it gets a little different for the hitter. Um, and that's when you kind of fall into more swing and miss, uh, swing and miss rates um, and chase rates for guys who are lower, uh, lower end on the rotational acceleration uh, spectrum. Cause as Kyle said, like you got to be able to make uh, late decisions at the plate. Uh, if you want to Absolutely. be successful and when you're facing grade 60, grade 70 pitches, um, you've got to be able to make that uh, decision to swing as late as possible. So as Kyle kind of alluded to, we kind of have like the, if you look at this uh, image right here, where uh, group one, that's kind of like the single digit rotational acceleration guys make the decision, uh, decision to swing. So they got to make a decision to swing super early. Uh, the group two is, I believe what 10, uh, which 10, 10 to 19 to in your 10, 10 to 19. Yeah. yeah. 10 to 19, which, you know, you can, that's, that's something to work with. That's something you can definitely be su successful with, but it's like the group three guys who are 20 plus T's on average. Um, those guys just have a quality that's way more favorable for them in professional baseball. Having said that, like you still need bat speed. It's a prerequisite thing um, for play professional baseball and the higher your bat speed, the more advantageous ro uh, high rotational acceleration would be for you because you're accelerating to something faster and more powerful. And if you're a guy with mass and size, bat speed plus mass and size equals pretty good raw power. So if you can accelerate into that raw power quickly, then you're going to be, you have a chance to be pretty successful. Um, I do want to note that like I say to be successful at high and above, because a lot of times in the past, I've like mistakenly said, like get past high and above. I mean, we've seen major league organizations move guys up, even when they aren't technically being successful or they haven't been there long enough to like deem that they've been successful at that level. So, you know, that is something to know and something to look for as well. Um, or that's something I want to clarify, yeah. but yeah, go ahead, Kyle. Yeah. You got to keep me on, you gotta keep me in the, you got to keep me on track when we talk about these things. Yeah. Don't worry, man. I will. So for <laughs> rotational acceleration, we get this question a lot, especially as we have players that are younger and are trying to progress they're focused on what metrics should they focus on. When you're at the top level, you're looking for little things that separate great players. When you're at the area code games, everyone's a great player. As you work up your way in the pyramid of playing at, you know, 12 to 14 to 16 to high school to elite levels, you're looking for little things that make a difference. And rotational acceleration is something that makes a difference. It's also one of our harder metrics to, um, it takes a little bit longer to improve because you are accelerating the bat. It's the way that the hitter moves their body and accelerates the bat. So a lot of times during development, these are things that can be tracked and seen over time. What your number is now doesn't mean it's what it's going to be in a year or two years, or we see guys progress and really improve these. Well, Joe, I think you've got some players that we'll talk about here, but at the highest level, these are things that we see where players, as they go through high school or they go through college, will have large changes in rotational acceleration. And as kids are getting older and they're developing into their bodies, this is where a lot of scout language uh, an evaluation of projecting of how good a player can be once they fill into their body, they get a little bit stronger. They put on a little bit, of, uh, they put on a little bit of weight. These can be really important, but at the end of the day at the highest level, we continuously see that rotational acceleration ties to performance because you can make a decision in that third cluster of balls in this picture right here. And it gives you the biggest opportunities to, to succeed. Uh, we have seen a lot when you don't have that rotational acceleration value, at least in the teens, it can be pretty tough to get that going. Um, Joe, do you have any players that we can talk about in the past? We see big leaguers from this account that we have data on Nolan Gorman, Jared Kelnick. I remember seeing Bobby Witt Jr. out there. Um, so there's a lot of guys that we see these in the area code games and progressed. We've seen guys that had lower middle range rotational acceleration and then eventually get it in college or throughout their draft year. Again, we're at the very beginning stages of the 2024 draft. So Joe, are there any players you saw there that uh, you can kind of mention or talk through on this metric and what we kind of saw? I'll go back to the original slide where we saw some of those averages as well. Yeah. Um, yeah. I, it was a pretty interesting year at area code for sure. I think um, there was, I mean, we're still getting to know these guys. I think it's going to be, I, it feels like it's going to be a pretty college heavy draft this year. I for sure. Um, 
Uh, I will note that these these are uh, averages for the underclass games. I should have mentioned that, Kyle. So, um, but I do have a lot of players in front of me. It's kind of interesting because, like, the one player that really kind of like stuck out in terms in terms of his tools and performance uh, was Xavier Nines. Nines, Nines. I don't know. Someone can correct me on that. But he's a Pacific Northwest kid with the Royals. He's actually, twenty twenty five kid. Um, so he has he has another year. But he looked really impressive. Uh, he he averaged from seventy. Uh, he had, had a seventy miles per hour a- bat speed average. Got up to seventy nine miles per hour. Um, the rotational acceleration metrics were at 23, 24 G's on average, and he got up to a thirty three point seven peak as well. So the bat moves really really well. So the quality was there, but the performance was also there. He batted five hundred at the area code games. Um, we had. A couple singles, um, and I think he works on pretty good counts. It's pretty like mature, pretty mature at bats that like you usually. I, we didn't see a lot of mature at bats right this year. I will say that there was a lot of kids who could throw super hard, hit the ball super far, hit the ball super hard. Um, but there, was, I would say like it was one of the more like unpolished events I've seen in a while. But the tools were good. Um, but yeah, Xavier Needs was very, uh, pretty, very. Pretty impressive. So um, he's definitely a note for someone for next year. Um, he was a home run derby participant too. He didn't win the home run derby. I think he only hit like three or four home runs, but he kind of put on like a really good batting performance in terms of like a pro workout at the home run derby, which is kind of funny. Um, he was like spraying the ball all over the field. It's all parts, uh, hard line drives and stuck, stuck a, a couple balls over the fence. So he was definitely one that was interesting. Uh, another player I thought was very interesting was Colin Mowry. Again, someone can correct me that M O W R Y. Uh, he's a catcher from Illinois. There's a couple other catching prospects that people probably are expecting me to talk about uh, from this past area code games. Um, to me, I felt Colin had the best tools and this quali- and the qualities in terms of blast metrics were really good. Um, and he's a catcher, and you don't see a ton of like really good hit tools coming out with catchers. It's usually defense first. Um, but he was 74 or 77 on bat speed. His rotational accelerations were, uh, were 22 to 28, so fast bat and quick bat. He also had some really good uh, uh, ABS area code games. Um, he The first pitch he saw at the area code games, he had a single uh, to left field. He hit it pretty hard. And then later on in the tournament, he had like a one-on-one exit below single up the middle for a pretty clutch RBI. So he was also really impressive. Another guy I really liked. There's a lot of raw power. He's a pretty big kid, um, so I liked him a lot as well. Uh, another kid we really liked was Ethan, man, these last names are so tough. Ethan Surowick, S-U-R-O-W-I-E-C. If anyone wants to correct me on that as well, please do. Um, really liked him. If in between games, you always see like scouts kind of like going on to the concourse and quiet, quietly, like kind of mumbling to each other who they like. And like, you can see, like, you can see like fingers pointing to their programs. You saw like the fingers point to like the middle of the nationals roster a lot. Uh, in between games, and it was pointing towards like Ethan Serwick. He has a lot of tools, uh, big time bat speed, big time raw power. He was he averaged 72 miles per hour in the bat speed, and he got to 78 miles per hour. Um, and his rotational acceleration metrics were 22 G's average, and another 30 uh, 30 plus G guy. Uh, he got to 30.2 on the peak. So wow. he was really, really yeah, he was really, really interesting. Um, let me tell you there, yeah. we see a lot of, yeah, those are good examples of what's going on and what teams are looking at. But this is an important point that I want to make sure we get out of this. We are recapping the area code games and our part as blast in it and capturing this metrics. Data is a piece to the puzzle. It's a tool in the toolbox to help understand and evaluate the players. I My job here at Blast is I work with all of the Major League Baseball teams, implementing Blast, understanding the data, getting on the scouting side, and all of that. So I get a firsthand look at how these teams operate. And the ones that do the best job are the ones that are looking at the player holistically. Now, data is a big part of that because it helps us understand what the player does with their bat what their swing tool is, what their fundamental mechanics are. And then you tie that into everything else like you're talking about. What's their presence on the field, their baseball IQ? How do their tools play with the actual game? There were a couple guys that you had mentioned where, you know, there were a lot of hard hit balls, a lot of guys throwing hard, but they aren't necessarily as polished. So when they're scouting these players, they're trying to project how good they can be when it comes. And using blasts and other tools to understand what that looks like helps them give a full evaluation of the player of where they are and when they can be 
or where they can be. And one of the big things that I want to call out too is that we capture at the underclass games and the upper class games. So a lot of times players from the underclass games end up playing in the upper class games. So getting historical data on players to see how much they've progressed also helps them identify how is this player going to project? When I look at his body type and where he is physically, is he going to get bigger? Is he going to get stronger? Are some of these metrics going to change? So when scouts are talking and evaluating players, they have the opportunity to say, okay, this is where he is now, and this is our holistic view on him, not only from our scout eyes, from what we see with stats and where they're playing, but from a data tech side as well. And that's one of the most important parts because I think sometimes people can miss on the like, oh, it's all about the data. It's all about the data. It's all about the data. It is a very important part of it, but baseball is a very tough game with a lot of things that go into it. So that's how some of the best people use uh, data as part of it. They look at their skill set, their cognitive skills, their on and off the field presence, and then their blast metrics. All of that makes up the player and our ability to capture historical data on these guys is what teams are looking for. And it's what they do with the data. So it's really cool to see. Um, I love seeing guys in the big leagues after we've seen them at the area code game. There was that fun fact you told me. It was like, there's never more money on the field other than a major league baseball game than at the area code games. Cause if you take everybody that got drafted and you add up all their signing bonuses, it's one of the most times there's uh, some of the most money on the field possible. Yeah, especially with the inflation with uh, uh, these signing bonuses now. It's crazy. So the last thing I want to talk about is the draft because that's kind of what we've been locking up to here. This is a picture of my TV at home. It was so fun to watch the draft this year because for the first time ESPN actually covered blast motion data at the draft. And this was super cool because um, here we have, we have Max Clark getting drafted we've got his average bat speed and rotational acceleration from the area code games we are looking at this data to understand why cool story a few years ago i was actually on mlb network for some of their shows uh some of the commercials on what blast was doing and when we were there to actually talk about what was going on jim tomey was there and it was right when like launch angle and bat uh exit velocities were getting popular and as i'm like halfway through my demo um i'm sorry the day before on the show, he was talking about he wants to understand what's going on with the player's bat. How are they moving that bat? How quickly is it moving? How are they accelerating it to really understand how he's getting these launch angles and then all these exit velocities? And in my head, I'm thinking, man, if he just knew what we were doing here at Blast, we have that picture. So fast forward a little bit, I'm actually at the studio giving a presentation and boom, in walks Jim Tomey. And we start talking about this type of stuff. Here we are, fast forward a couple of years later, and we're actually talking about bat speeds, rotational accelerations at the draft on ESPN. This is data that we captured from the previous year and it was pretty cool to see. So this stuff is moving forward and we are a big part of it and we are super excited to do that. So cool story here, Max Clark, ESPN on the draft blast motion data and there he is right around major league average getting drafted right out of high school we saw him not only at area code but we saw him at the pbr super 60 we've had our eye on him for a while as a lot of other people have joe anything else you want to add man no that was pretty well said <laughs> very cool so thank you guys for tuning in this is actually our very first episode of the blast motion podcast we are here to bring real insights and knowledge from our experts here at blast customers data inside look at how technology is being used hope you tune in to some other shows and get some quality information we'll see you guys soon